Yes, Sue, have you heard? And what? What's on the big breakfast tomorrow? No. We're going behind the scenes at Barry Manilow's Copacabana party. Oh, yeah. There's an anorak who's obsessed with tunnels. Oh. And uh, John Barnes is going to be dribbling all over Paula's bed. That'd be nice for Paula. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the gossip tomorrow. Top secret documents reveal why the Channel Tunnel was really built. Yes, Le Tour is coming across to Britain. But exactly who or what is the British connection? Just who is this man going by the name of Phil, seen following the tour day and night? And what on earth is the purpose of this grueling 4,000 kilometer, 23 day assignment? Our surveillance suggests it's all in a yellow jersey and the name Indio Rain. A mission impossible. The Tour de France starts July the 2nd on 4. This summer, Ford has three Fiesta specials all at the same price. Which is right for you? Number one, the Fiesta Mistral. Has a spoiler, tailgate wash wipe, sunroof, and radio cassette. And like the other Fiestas, it has a driver's airbag and safeguard engine immobilizer as standard. And all for £7,695. See the Fiesta specials at your Ford showroom now. The Fiesta Mistral. It's much more of a car. The town called them outlaws. You touch her again, you're a dead man. They called it justice. Madeline Stowe, Mary Stewart Masterson, Drew Barrymore, and Andy McDowell. Bad girls. In this kind of emergency, go straight for a stain remover with the power to tackle most household stains. 1001 Troubleshooter. in the world ever 44 massive reggae hits including 10 number ones the best reggae album in the world ever 44 hits all on one great value double cd and cassette it's the one the world's been waiting for want to get into movies and a yes, and a yes. Are you between 16 and 20? Oh, yay. Would you like five two-pound cinema vouchers? Gee, let me think. Yeah? Yeah. Open a TSB interest check account in near yours. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah. 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 TSB, we want you to say. Yes. That's correct. time of war and destruction, a time of myth and legend. I give you Jason and the Argonauts. Comes a classic quest. Those who steal the golden fleece must die. Kill, kill, kill them all! Jason and the Argonauts, Saturday, 6.30 on 4. Not hippie, just hip. The world's a stage and that stage is Glastonbury. Watch out for the best bands live and in highlights across the weekend, starting tomorrow on Channel 4. It's cool to be part of the herd. More of the very best bits now on four of the word.
The best of the weird bounces back this week with the Twinkle Toad, Lionel Blair, teen sensation Joey Lawrence, and Australian super hunks, The Iron Men. Plus, music from Primal Scream, Real to Real, and New Kingdom. Spread the word. It seems like every time you turn on the television nowadays, it's football, 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 and uh, tonight's show is no exception. That's why I'm wearing this shirt, a sentimentalist, you see, at heart, which is why I wept with joy when they asked me to come back. Mm, I'm sure you did, Terry. Well, on the last series of television's most talked-about show, we featured over 50 live bands, and here is one of the finest, Primal Scream, with the first single off the album, Give Out But Don't Give Up, rocks. <laughs> screen from Scotland. They didn't qualify for the World Cup either with rocks. And later in the show, we've got music from Real to Real and New Kingdom. But now, our first super celebrity of the evening, Mark Lamar meets showbiz legend Lionel Blair. What a popular guest. Yeah, again. Now, I imagine, I imagine, listen to that. Crowd go wild. Come on, come on, I want to speak to the man. I imagine a lot of these people will only know you from giving the clue and name that tune. So I should think so, that's all they do. The enemy is a dancer. So let's, let's, I mean, you should list, list all the things you've done over, over 40 years in showbiz. 40 years in showbiz, oh, well, acting. I started as an actor, really. Uh, pantomime, singing, dancing, acting, Shakespeare, films. Well, so you, you, you have done absolute the, beginners. That's the, yeah, yeah, absolute course, beginners. Yeah. That's so you've done the full Monty there. I've done the full Monty. What, what has what's been your personal highlight? I should imagine there's, there are many. Of oh, there've been a lot. One of the biggest was I think working with Sammy Davis Jr. That was a great. He was a.
fantastic guy. Because you, you are, in a way, not a, obviously you're not black and you haven't got one eye, <laughs> but apart from that, you are sort of Britain's answer to Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, you know, I the, wish. The all-round entertainer and all that sort of thing. You know, he came to see me once in Cadbury without telling me he came to see me, and he was great. He got up and said, if Lionel Blair were black, he'd be a genius. <laughs> 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 he, was, he was my best friend. I miss him very much to this day. Is there anyone else that you've never worked with that, that you absolutely love to? Oh, yes, Mark Lamar. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. Do you think we should dance together? Do you? Would you like no, to No, they don't want us to. Would no, they like don't want us to dance. Would you like to have a dance? I would. I would have to, like, have to have a little dance lesson. And if there's one man that's going to take to me, it's obviously going to be you. The last time I, I, I danced with someone sort of interviewing me was Simon D. Oh, dear, so that's Do you what, remember Simon or something? D? No, I'm oh, far Now, you and I are going to have a little, little dance here. You okay. Okay, let's take it away. We, we, I think we've got some hats and canes there somewhere. Can I have my cane, please? Hat and cane, cane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can we have some music? Music, I think so. Oh, I'm ready, I'm going to turn it. And while Mark was tapping his toes with Lionel, our Hofty was down kicking sand in the faces of Australia's hunkiest heartthrob. The Iron Men are the safe and sound superheroes of Australia. In 30 years, they've gone from being lifeguards on Sydney's famous Bondi Beach to national sporting heroes with their own television show. And their fans, both young and old, adore them. Yeah, they're really sexy. They are Iron Men. They seem to be made of iron, they don't stop. Nice bugs. Definitely nice bums. And they're really spunky. The Iron Man Challenge is a series of grueling races which includes swimming, ski paddling, board paddling and running. It's a televised two-hour event that's reckoned to be the toughest sport in the world. This is unbelievable. I tell you what, I think his handlers might have thrown us a furphy. If that shoulder's popped out, I'm the monkey's uncle. Down under it's every boy's dream to be a top Iron Man. 30-year-old Guy Leach is to Australia what Shaquille O'Neal is to America. His face and body sells everything from sportswear to cars. And after 10 years at the top, he's still spending four hours in the gym and a further three hours battling the surf. When I started doing Iron Man, there was never any financial rewards there, you know. It was, he did it for the love of it, and I still do that. But he does it for the money too. With prize money of over a quarter of a million pounds per series, plus bonuses and lucrative sponsorship deals, Iron Man is big business. And there's plenty of young pretenders wanting a piece of the action. Corey is only 21 years old, but has already captained the New Zealand Iron Man team and is set to reach the lofty heights of his heroes. I came over here when I was 16, I was a little weak grommet, and I actually came over and I saw Rido and Leachie and all those guys, and to me it was a big thing then, if only I knew now. But, um, <laughs> For me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm still one of the younger guys and uh, the financial, you know, I'm obviously not got a leech with all his assets and money and that, but, you know, I want what he's got. So does every other Aussie lad, because along with the fortune comes the fame. Iron Men are the golden boys of the Australian media. Hanging with the Iron Men has now become essential for any celebrity. Even Madonna sought them out on the Australian leg of her last world tour. Oh, cheers, all you pummy b****. The word. Gossip. Who's that girl? Like all supermodels, £10,000 a shoot L. the body McPherson has a word or two of advice for us lesser mortals. Don't drink, don't take drugs, take care of yourself, be balanced and be happy. This constant American-style grazing and finger food is the killer. But where does Elle dine down under? At the Colonel's, of course. A tender oatmeal, please. No nouvelle for our Elle.
she's having her very own Mac attack. I like it like that. Still to come in part two of the best of the word music from reel to reel, Rachel Vice joins Lionel Blair on the sofa and teen sensation Joey Lawrence. Whose fans did we imprison behind bars on the word? Find out after the break. The word. Ford were the first to introduce options, a new way to drive a new Ford. With a simple deposit and installments, over 60,000 customers are now driving a new Ford through options. It puts you in control. At the end of an agreed period, you have three options. One, pay the final balance to keep the car. Two, give it back to Ford and walk away. Or three, allowing for the balance, part exchange it for a new Ford. So. If you want to get in the driving seat, you should find out more about options. The smart way to drive a new Ford. The action never stops. The excitement go, go, go. never ends. And the ride is better than ever. Eddie Murphy, Beverly Hills Cop 3. Trust me on this one, okay? HMV presents the ultimate 80s. 40 massive hits on the album of the decade, including 13 number ones. An unbelievable collection of superstars and classic hits. On one great value double album, the ultimate 80s at HMV. No HMV, no music. Want to get into movies? Yes! And a yes, and a yes. Are you between 16 and 20? Oh, yes. Would you like five two-pound cinema vouchers? Gee, let me think. Yes? Yes. Open a TSB interest check account and near yours. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah. 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 TSB, we want you to say. Yes. Take it easy, Mr. Mo. Uh -huh. Don't you know that if you find my picture in your Cadbury's caramel wrapper, you'll win one of 1,500 pocket televisions. Take it even easier with Cadbury's caramel. ask you whose fans did we imprison behind bars on the word? The answer is... Oh, get out of here! The fanatical followers of those Brazilian thrash metal gods, Sepultura. Welcome back to Best of the Word, and in this half of the show, we've got Joey Lawrence, Rachel Vice, and music from New Kingdom. And I don't want to get too embroiled in the football terms, but uh, kicking us off in good style is a band who spent 12 weeks in the charts with I Like to Move It, Real to Real.
Thank you. Real to real with, I like to move it. Now it's time for Lionel Blair to shift up a bit on the sofa and make room for tonight's next guest. Brainy, beautiful and only 23 years old, actress Rachel Weisz has it all. A top model at only 13, she turned her back on the catwalk for an English degree from Cambridge University. But says her ambition is to be a bimbo. Welcome to the word, Rachel. Rachel? Rachel? More the pleasure for Lionel. He's got his arm around him. <laughs> I'm a great fan. <laughs> Did you see Scarlet and Black? No, she was, I didn't. She was wonderful. Just wonderful. Most, oh, people, no, most no. people would know you from Scarlet and Black, but you've also done some uh, some saucier adventures of late. Right. In this very studio. That's right, yeah. Just upstairs, I am in McShane. Right. Yeah, just upstairs. In fact, in your... Lucky you. I know, oh, yeah. I know. Some girls have all the light. In the control room. Where is it? Where is it? Up uh, there? Up there. Up yeah. there, in the control room, yeah. Nine, nine can really? see it. It's just pointing, really. <laughs> How do you prepare for, for um, a love scene with, with Lovejoy? Um, you can't prepare, you just have to go with the flow at the moment. You and what happened? Did he, didn't, did he just sort of say, take me now, Rachel? Or, or, uh... um, no, he didn't actually. He said, uh, he said no tongues, love. <laughs> Cheeky bugger. No, but then in the end, in the event, when we were improvising, our, we used tongues as well. You did? We did. You've tongued Ian McShane. Uh... <laughs> you lucky girl. <laughs> Another word exclusive. <laughs> Poor old Danny <laughs> suffers more than most on this show. Like, for instance, uh, when she was sent off to Los Angeles to interview Joey Lawrence. Hard life, innit? You know, it's true. This is the NBC studios in Hollywood, and I'm here to visit the set of Blossom to meet one of its biggest stars. He's an actor. How could this be? He's a pop star. Ah, uh, oh, you know, it's true. But most of all, he's a teen sensation that sends the young girls into a frenzy. He is, of course, Joey Lawrence. <laughs> Oh, how I'd long to meet little Joey. That lovely smile, that wavy hair, those big brown eyes. 17 years old and already a successful acting career and chart-topping album behind him. A dream date for any young lady. So what's it like being the most famous 17-year-old in America? Tell me about it. It's just one of those things that, that happens every once in a while. And I just knock, knock, knock on wood. I feel extremely lucky to be here. And uh, I, I know that, you know, several other people could be right here and they're not. At the tender age of 17, Joey's already a veteran of show business. He's had an agent since the age of five when he sang on Johnny Carson's Late Show. After a string of commercials and sitcom appearances, he finally got his big break playing the less than intelligent Joey Russo on NBC's top rating teen comedy, Blossom. Joey. What? Do you think I'm attractive? What, are you kidding? Of course not. <laughs> All he wants to do is play baseball and um, go out with girls. And exactly, you know, and, and, that's, and that's about it. Come on, that's not true. I have a lot more, you know, um, structured life, and, and I have goals and things like, like that. He is a quiet, unassuming kid who keeps mostly to himself. I like hanging out with my, with, with my family um, and my best friend. You know, he's been my best friend for, like, ever. Um, and, you know, if there's a girl in the picture or whatever, then, then, then her. But if... But if not, then just the family. And the best Is there a girl in the picture right now? Well, um, no, not right, not right now. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. With a nifty line in Teen Talk. It's actually awesome. It's fabulous. Yeah. Smooth. Really awesome. And a natty line in Threads. I don't wear these all, all, all the time. I just wore them today for some weird reason. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> Joey knows how to keep his fans begging for more. And with over 7,000 fan letters a week, it seems Joey has the pick of the crop. I'm, I'm at this art of graph signing thing at the small there's like 10,000 people and this one girl walks up and says I like you for you and I'm like you don't even know me <laughs> but Joey isn't sidetracked by his popularity with the oh, girls wake up at about um, I don't know 7.30 you know um, go to school for three and a half hours and then I go and take a shower and I come here and work and, and at night I go into the studio and uh, work on the on the uh, record you know I want to um, eventually get married, have a family and things, and that's my, that's my goal. I really want to do that. And that's why I'm working hard now. What's All too soon, it was time to go to a little souvenir. I'm sure he can afford another pair, though. The bird. Gossip. Look back in anguish. With his show heartbeat pulling in more viewers than his old series EastEnders, Nick Berry is one of Britain's most successful actors. And that's not all. Now, one thing I'm on this show. Since 
He also sang his way to top pop star status. But we've unearthed some early footage of Mick singing and dancing as a bobby. He was just 15 when he appeared at the Sylvia Young Theatre School, and Nick knew he looked good in a uniform. Thankfully, his acting has improved, but I'm not so sure about the singing. You've been nicked, Nick. That's almost it for this week, barring injury time. On the next best of the word, there's Arsenal and England super striker Ian Wright, Sly Stallone's ex-Mrs. Bridget Nielsen, plus Raven Simone from The Cosby Show, and the fake Madonna who conned America. But playing us out tonight, though, here's New Kingdom with cheap thrills. And watch out for Lionel Blair strutting his funky stuff. <laughs> The kids should think I ain't knocking nobody's ways. So don't rock the kids off no pain. Ooh, I've been going down a few too many. I've been picked up by my sister Jenny. Hustle down a few, you might say plenty. I've been lifted by my lady Jenny. I done smoked the moon and the stars. Can you dig it when I'm out this far? I done seen the tides turn. Yeah. I done watched my baby's pump. What can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Now I saw the light, but then I came down. I swore I heard the air, but it was my sound. Always losing in my own head. Always tripping in my own bed. Living in shit, just shit. Never poor was never well fed. Never known to keep a steady job. Never known to be no boring love. I done smoke the moon in the sky. Can you dig it when I'm out this far? I done seen the tides turn. Come on. Watch my lips. Ha ha. My God is willing to know. Come on, daddy. Come on, daddy. Well, can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Or can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Can you dig it when I'm out this far? Yeah! Now I showed it out, but then I came down. I swore I heard the hell, but it was my sound. Always dripping in my own head. Only dripping in my own head. Josie, your hair looks like three seagulls have died on it. That's because <laughs> I use new Whose Shampoo Is It Anyway? And don't you get that from July on Friday nights? Yes, I do, from July. It's back. I just put it on and make it up as I go along. And I get into the shower as well. Coming soon to Channel 4, a brand new series of Whose Line Is It Anyway? Emmerdale's Joe Sugden about his final weeks down on the farm, tomorrow on GMTV. And so, our two greatest warriors must do battle, David and Goliath! Look, little guy, there's no need to fight over this. Let's talk it through over a can of iron brew. Another bleeding heart liberal. Save it, Thunder Thighs. But violence never solved anything. Just my luck. An eight-foot boy scout. You heard the man. Let's go. 
Who said the film has to be like the book? Where I'm going, I can't be sure what they'll be having for breakfast, so I'm packing me own. I'll definitely be wanting bran fiber, no added sugar or salt, and 100% whole wheat. So it can only be shredded wheat. Will you be needing anything else, love? No. With this lot and a bit of luck, we'll be fine. Shredded wheat and bite-sized too. There is no better cereal. Blatant is beautiful. An open relationship. I love you, Mark, so much. I don't even like to think about it. A shared affliction. If you die, let me leave me alone with AIDS. To confront it, difficult. She would like me to keep my shirt on so I don't freak out any of the people. To record it, brave. It's so tough. The fading of a life, the importance of memory, in True Stories, tonight at 9.30 on 4. Now we join John Snow and Shanaz Bagravan at ITN for the Channel 4 News. The time, 7 o'clock. The government moves to rectify the pensions nightmare faced by 11 million contributors. Good evening. It was John Major as junior Social Security Minister who helped drive the government's pension reforms through in 1986. Today, Peter Lilly unveiled a white paper to rectify the consequences of that legislation, highlighted by the thousands who've been sold bad pensions and by Robert Maxwell's multi-million pound theft of pension funds. A personal embarrassment for the government tonight, too. The Education Secretary, John Patton, has had to apologize and pay substantial damages to an education chief whom he called a madman and a nutter. Also tonight we talk with Tony Blair, aspiring Labour leader, as he publishes his vision of a new Britain. Abroad tonight, the first French paratroopers arrive in Rwanda. But can they reduce the killing or will they stir still more hatred because of their historic support for the old Hutu-led government? As the Times slashes its price again, the stock market investigates unusual movements in telegraph shares ahead of its price cuts. The royal yacht Britannia is to be scrapped. It's undecided if the Queen will get another. She's also to pay for her flights. And the growing threat of loyalist violence. We examine the motives behind the present climate of fear. The government has announced new laws for the running of company pension schemes. It says it wants to restore employees' confidence in the industry shattered after the collapse of the Maxwell Empire. The proposals unveiled by the Social Security Secretary, Peter Lilly, will include the appointment of a pensions regulator and there will be compensation payments to help the victims of fraud or theft. Mr Lilly also pledged to create schemes to give equal pension rights to men and women. Our economics correspondent Steve Levinson reports now on a new future for the pensions industry and on the pensioners for whom it has all come too late. Vince Scott had been hoping to enjoy his retirement by now. Instead, he's still working full time. He's been a printer all his life, and for 17 years he paid into a company pension scheme. His misfortune was that in 1984, his then employer was taken over by Robert Maxwell. Even when he moved to a new job, he thought his 17-year pension nest egg was safe where it was. But he was wrong. His pension had been raided, and he was left with nothing. Now, unable to retire, he's putting a quarter of his pay into a private scheme to try and fill the gap. It's my money. I want it. I need it. I've got to have it back. And my wife and I, we thought we were going to start looking forward to, you know, a gradual winding down and looking forward to, or maybe an early retirement. But the thing is now, we can't afford to buy a car. We have to have a cheap skate holidays, if we're going to have one. If the washing machine conks out, we have to look, can we afford to get it repaired? You know, and if it, can we afford to buy a new one? Well, we can't afford to buy a new one. In the wake of the Maxwell scandal, providing for existing pensioners has been given priority. Deferred pensioners like Vince and 5,500 others who are still working have no guarantee there's any money for them, and they have no faith that new legislation will help. I can't emphasise my anger more, other than becoming you know, violent, I suppose, but uh, of absolute frustration of not being able to do anything. 
I've seen, I've been to uh, lobby my MP four times to David McDowell, who I must say has been very helpful. But of course, we get to the brick wall of Peter Lilly. Peter Lilly was himself trying to erect a brick wall to stand up against any future Robert Maxwells. Adopting many proposals from a committee under Professor Roy Good, his white paper includes new powers for trustees, a new regulatory regime, strict financial controls on pensions and a compensation scheme. But while he said this was a response to the Maxwell case, he admitted the victims might still feel aggrieved. There's certainly nothing retrospective. Uh, we're talking about a regime that will prevent that sort of thing happening in future. And uh, in the event that any fraud nonetheless gets through the several lines of defense which we propose to erect, that there will be a compensation scheme in future, but we couldn't make that retrospective. And I think we're building Even as Mr. Lilly was explaining has, his proposals, they um, came under fierce attack from the TUC as follow. being too weak and too long worked, delayed. Uh, the GMB union called on Mr. Lilly to resign. Inside the Commons, there was also unease on the opposition benches. The government claims to have taken the essence of the good report and to use uh, the white paper's phrase, distilled it. Perhaps it would be better, Madam Speaker, to say boiled it down. Uh, does the Minister recognise that there will be concern, as Professor Good and his colleagues saw their recommendations as a package, and what we've got to some extent is akin uh, to pick and mix? But many of the Good Report's 218 recommendations have been accepted. Among them, proposals that pension fund assets should never be less than 90% of liabilities, a future compensation scheme to cover 90% of losses from fraud, and a ban on loans by pension funds to employers. But the White Paper has reservations elsewhere. Good wanted an all-powerful pensions regulator funded by the state. The White Paper prefers a regulatory board paid for by the industry. And while Good said in some circumstances employees should make up two-thirds of trustees, the government is unwilling to go above one-third. None of this goes anywhere near far enough to satisfy those close to the Maxwell scandal. They thought the Good Report was pretty lame, and are even less happy with a more watered-down version. Even if all of the proposals were implemented in full, there would be no guarantee that you would have trustees who were strong enough to stand up to Maxwell, and therefore he would still be able to run off with the money. And if he did run off with the money, the proposals for compensation, whilst they might help people in the future, will do nothing at all to help the Maxwell pensioners. For Vince Scott, all this is of little comfort. His music may provide some relaxation, but he's no better off after the government's new moves and faces a future clouded by uncertainty. Steve Levinson. Controversy continued for the government today with the Education Secretary John Patton facing an embarrassing libel action at the High Court. Mr Patton agreed to pay substantial damages to Birmingham's Chief Education Officer, Professor Tim Brighouse, after calling him a madman and a nutter during a fringe speech at the Conservative Conference last year. Labour called for Mr Patton to resign, but the government said it was a private matter and did not affect his ability to advance education policies. Mr Patton was not in court. He was attending the Cabinet's key meeting on public spending. Our political reporter Gary Gibbon considers now the implications of Mr Patton's embarrassment for his future in government. The Education Secretary emerged with colleagues from a tough round of spending talks at this morning's Cabinet to discover that he'd considerably overshot his personal spending estimates. At the High Court in London, it was announced that Mr Patton was to pay substantial damages, believed to be around £100,000, to a leading education official he'd publicly insulted. Mr Patton made his attack on Birmingham's chief education officer, Professor Tim Brighouse, at a fringe meeting off-camera at last year's Conservative conference. Mr Patton described Professor Brighouse as a nutter and a madman, and as a man who was incapable of running a news conference. Mr Patton said he feared for Birmingham, where Professor Brighouse had just taken up a senior education post. Mr Patton soon apologised for his remarks, saying that they were satirical and not literal. At the High Court this morning, through his solicitor, Mr Patton expressed his deep regret for the remarks and acknowledged in a statement previously agreed with Professor Brighouse's solicitor that his comments were entirely untrue. Mr Patton made serious accusations of professional misconduct against Professor Brighouse, who is a public servant and not free to answer back. Mr Patton has now publicly acknowledged that his remarks were false and without any justification whatsoever. Professor Brick and, and, and he has apologized.
Mr. Beinman's client, Professor Brighouse, has chosen to put Mr. Patton's money into educational projects in one of Mr. Patton's least favorite education authorities. Certainly it will be for the benefit of children within city areas and principally and overwhelmingly in Birmingham. What's your impression of John Patton now? I think he's a very honorable person to, uh, we, that we settled the matter together. Mm. With John Major's cabinet reshuffle pending, there's inevitable speculation that the education secretary could be nearing the end of his troubled term. In May 1992, he forfeited the goodwill of a teacher's group often willing to listen to the government when he declined to address the National Association of Head Teachers Conference. Almost a year later, he refused to attend a North of England local education authority conference, earning himself the nickname The Invisible Man. Three months after that, when he finally emerged into the spotlight of the Easter round of teachers' conferences, he was widely accused of misjudging the strength of feeling against national school tests. The hurt feelings amongst the educational establishment spurred a £27,000 appeal to help Professor Brighouse bring the court action. And I must say that the wider background for this is the denigration that has gone on on the part of the government led by Mr. Mr. Major, who himself has been involved in this, a denigration of people in education, uh, a finding of scapegoats for all that's wrong in the education system without taking any responsibility for themselves. At question time, the leader of the Commons, standing in for the Prime Minister, faced opposition calls for Mr. Patton's resignation. Madam Speaker, my right honourable friend has straightforwardly apologised and and, and agreed reparation for the remarks to which the Honourable Gentleman refers, and in my judgment at least, the matter should be left there. It does not, it does not in any way affect my right Honourable Friend's ability to advance the government's very successful educational policy. It was later explained that Mr Patton would personally be paying the entire damages and costs agreed, and that there would be no financial help at all from the government. The Education Secretary's difficulties turned attention away from a key cabinet meeting which recommitted the government to the 1995 spending limits announced in the last budget. Mr Clark said the limits would prove very tough and the government appears braced for a pre-budget season of special pleading from Conservative backbenchers. Many in the party now desperately want the government to prepare the way for tax cuts in the belief that good news on tax and fewer humiliating ministerial gaffes are essential for political recovery. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News, Westminster. While the government was embroiled in policy and personal issues, Labour was doing its best to keep up its show of unity. The front-runner for the party leadership, Tony Blair, promised a radical and vibrant New Britain to replace what he called the tragedy and waste of the last 15 years of Conservative government. Launching his personal manifesto, he vowed that if he was to become Prime Minister, he would end the national drift and put Britain on the move again. The theme of Tony Blair's 5,000-word leadership statement is change and national renewal. On the economy, he reaffirms the goal of full employment, supports fair taxation based on progressive principles, promises investment in education and skills, and proposes a new social partnership between employers and employees. On social policy, he promises to modernize the welfare state and a crusade against crime. Constitutional reform would involve a Bill of Rights, devolution of power to the nations and regions, and an elected House of Lords. In the European Union, Britain's approach would be constructive and committed under his leadership. On party reform, he proposes to renew Labour as a mass membership party by encouraging many more thousands to join. A short while ago, I talked to Tony Blair about his vision of the Labour leadership, and I asked him first whether people wouldn't always, in the end, vote with their pockets, however much they might seem to support Labour on other issues. Well, I think one of the big differences that's happened in the past few years is that people have seen the tax rises introduced by the Conservatives, and they now understand that if we don't have a high-success economy, we have a high-tax economy. And so I think that that has changed, but also it's necessary, in my view, for the Labour Party to set out not just its policies, but very clearly its ideas and its vision and persuade people. And part of the job of politics is to persuade. And this document today is an attempt to persuade people as to why the values and principles that lie behind the Labour Party are the right ones for the country. But in doing that, you might actually have to tell them the truth about tax increases. Uh, do you actually think that we've reached the point uh, in our democracy where people would be prepared to listen to the truth and react positively to it? Well, they've had the truth about tax increases now. 
after the election from the Conservatives. But I think that what we should be saying is that the future of the economy lies in investing and modernising our industry and in particular education and skills. If we don't get that right, we won't have the capacity to grow and we'll end up with, as we've got with the Conservatives, which are tax increases not to lay the foundations of future success, but to pay the past bills of economic failure. And the single two most important facts of the whole of the Tory 15 years is one, that the tax bill as a proportion of income is up from the last Labour government and the spending bill is up. Now, we've not used that money wisely and indeed in the meantime they've squandered North Sea oil and they've sold off some of the assets of the nation. What's happened is that because growth has been low and the capacity of the economy has not been strong enough, we've not paid our way and that's the Labour message for today. And I think it's very, very important that we get that message across to people and, and what differentiates the Labour Party, if I can just make this point, what differentiates the Labour Party from the Conservatives is that we understand that you will only build that strong economy if we're prepared to build a strong society around it. The market won't deliver all these things. We need to live in a market economy, but we also need to make sure that we are investing as a country in our capacity and in our education to provide the wealth generating base for the future. Well, one of the things that you have spelt out even in your shadow portfolio to this point has been the damage wrought by economic policy, which has resulted uh, through unemployment, very often in broken down communities, in high crime. But if you are going for um, full employment, should you not have a timetable? Should you not tell people how long it's going to be before you get them back to work? I just don't think it's possible to, to pluck a, a figure out of the air and say, well, by this amount of time we'll do such and such. And I think that the question the public will ask us is not whether the goal of full employment is sensible. I think that they will think it is sensible because you can't have a decent and cohesive society unless people get the chance to work. The question that they will ask us, however, is how? How is this going to be done? And I think it is more important to set out the policy initiatives that are going to reduce unemployment and strengthen industry than it is to set a target and, in a sense, have the target first and then the policy. Better to get the policy in place. But isn't there a danger in this particular race that you're engaged in that the other two candidates are, in fact, pledging a greater commitment to more immediate full employment than you appear to be? No, because I think, in the end, we all stand by the policies of the party. And those are policies to reduce unemployment directly through jobs programs and so forth, but also, and this is very important, you, you can't achieve full employment unless the economy as a whole is functioning effectively. And no matter how many good jobs programs and how much common sense you apply in marrying together the unused human resources with the unmet need in society and creating such programs, in the end, unless your macroeconomic framework and the measures that you're taking to boost the supply side of industry are strong enough, unless you're generating that wealth, you'll always have an unemployment problem. And the real difficulty is, as we go into each conservative recession, we end up with ever higher levels of structural unemployment. Well, now, one of the things which has happened, which the Labour Party has charted over the last 15 years, has been the reduction of individual workers' rights. And uh, the party, and indeed you, have talked about improving uh, the position of the individual worker. Shouldn't, therefore, you, as the damage is so great, go back and rip up all that the government has done on trade union reform uh, and, and start again? No, because I think the sensible thing is, and this is the party's policy, and I played a part in constructing that before the last election, we don't need to rerun the arguments of the 1970s, and it's not in the interests of either the country nor indeed in the interests of trade unions to do so. What we should have is a proper, positive framework of rights for people at work, exercisable individually and through their trade union and it should balance rights and responsibilities throughout. But Mrs. Beckett seems to be going much further than that. She does talk about scrapping. Is that the big difference between you? I, I don't really think so, because I think if you analyse carefully what Margaret's saying, she accepts that ballots before strikes and ballots for union elections and so on should stay. And th th those things have widespread support. And the most important thing for people at the workplace is to get protection against unfair treatment at work whether through these appalling levels of poverty pay or through bad health and safety or through not getting the type of protection that other European countries offer as a matter of course. You don't think that the electorate will find it difficult to, to vote for a Blair Beckett team, for example, one of whom does seem to aspire uh, to a much tougher reform of trade union rights than you do? 
Well, as I said to you, I'm not sure that that is the case, but in any event, Margaret performed the task of deputy and performed it indeed extremely well uh, under John Smith, and I am happy for either of the two colleagues, either Margaret Beckett or John Prescott, to be deputy, because I think they are both excellent people with a lot to contribute to the country. Can I just uh, ask you one um, personal question, and I know all politicians like to keep personal issues out, but, um, I mean, this but for the sad passing of John Smith was something which shouldn't by any rights have happened to you for another mm -hmm. decade, by which time your children would have been teenagers. And Has it been a difficult decision to decide even to go for the leadership? Sure. I mean, these decisions are, are big life decisions, and you don't take them you know, with a disregard of the effect on your family and those around you. But if you come into politics because you believe in certain things and want to achieve them, then when something like this occurs and it is the right thing to do, then you do it, because otherwise there's no point in being in politics. It's not another job. It's something that's a bit more akin to a vacation. And although, of course, you know, I've weighed up these things very carefully, I've got no doubt at all that it is the right thing to do, because I think that the most important thing of all is to get the Labour Party into government and to get it into government, not just to switch management between ourselves and the Conservatives, but with a clear vision for Britain's future that we can then implement and put the Conservatives out of office, not just for a parliament, but for a generation. Tony Blair, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Now, after the break, over the border into Rwanda. Less than a day after receiving approval from the United Nations, French troops move in to secure a key refugee camp. And here, as the newspaper Price War hots up, the stock exchange launches an inquiry following a crash in Telegraph share prices. Ten measly grand for a company car. I mean, what kind of impression could I make in a ten grand car? I'd be a laughing stock. But then I spotted this new golf match. Very individual. And the spec, alloy wheels, power steering, pollen filter, even a CD player is standard. So now my colleagues think I've gone up a notch. Which means I get loads more work to do. If only everything in life was as reliable as a Volkswagen. Without a conductor, there is no orchestra. Without Hellman's, there is no sandwich. Original, creamy smooth Hellman's, the only mayonnaise. Okay. Great. Rewind. <laughs> Too far. Avant Garde, the new body spray from Impulse. Like most people who want to set up a small business, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. Until I met a NatWest small business advisor, appropriately enough, in my local branch. He got in touch with NatWest's small business information people. When the document arrived, I was amazed. Firstly, because it was free, and then because it gave me so much information, including how to apply for grants for things like people, equipment, 